Uh, welcome to everyone who is joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Michael Skaggs. I'm the Executive Director of the Chaplaincy Innovation Lab, and I'm very excited uh, that this is our very first webinar since launching the lab uh, recently. And so if this was, a, uh, if this was an actual live event uh, with, with people, I would pause here and everybody would clap uh, <laughs> to celebrate this occasion. So uh, we're very glad that you're all here and we're gonna have a, a wonderful conversation here uh, with Donna. Uh, Reverend Donna Mote is the Missioner for Engagement and Innovation in the Episcopal Diocese of Atlanta, but more importantly for our purposes, she is the chaplain to Atlanta's Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport, the busiest airport in the world, which I guess you could say makes you the busiest chaplain in the world by some uh, connection. But in any case, uh, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon, Donna. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be with you. So we'll start with a really easy question. Tell us how you have ended up doing what you're doing today. Well, there's, uh, there's some longer versions of an answer to that and there's some much shorter versions. Um, I, think, um, I think the easiest version is to say, airports have been important in my life, uh, across my life, and that's the first part of a short answer. And the second part of a short answer is um, my bishop asked what I wanted to do in addition to teaching. And I said I wanted to be at the airport. So uh, two lessons there. I think one is uh, for the second part, always be ready when somebody asks you what you want to do, especially if they're in a position to help you make it happen, because he was. Uh, and to the first part, would you, would you put that first image up that we were just... Uh, talking about, uh, Parker Palmer tells us we should let our life speak. And when he says that, um, he's saying pay attention to the stuff that, that keeps cropping up across your life, right? So this is my first ATL memory. Uh, I am the smaller person in that image, presenting, I'm two years old here, and I'm presenting my grandmother with a bouquet of roses as she came back from her first trip to Asia. This is 1966. So from uh, a very early age, I have had significant experiences in Atlanta airport. So that's the old 1961 terminal, which was um, pulled down to make way for the current domestic terminal. Uh, but when I think about that image, I think about everything that's going on there. So what, what you can't see in that photo is that my mom and her sisters and my three siblings and all my cousins, my eight cousins, and I are all there to welcome grandmother home. And I was carried through the terminal by my brother. And, uh, and then because I was the youngest grandchild at the time, I was given this ritual role of going to, to meet the grandmother. And she'd been gone for a while and I'm only two, so I didn't quite remember who she was. That's why I'm looking at my mom like, are you sure this is my grandmother? Um, but anyway, I think it's, it's helpful sometimes to realize um, that some things that really call to us that are a really good fit for us have, uh, have been part of our lives for a long time. So that's my very first ATL memory there with my grandmother. Um, and uh, I, I often, you know, in that same spirit, I'm, these days though, I'm usually the person who's a little better oriented to what's happening. There are a lot of other people <laughs> moving through that airport who, uh, who are, who are looking to me, my grandmother's looking to me in that photo, but uh, I was looking away. Now I'm able to connect with them and, and help them find their way. So um, I also think part of how I wound up there is I've had the privilege of being able to travel to lots of places across my life and almost always benefit from the hospitality of strangers one way or another, often in really confusing uh, transportation hubs like the main train station in Tokyo and places like that sort of ant hills of human activity where everybody is just moving around and if you know where you're going then you're fine and if you don't know where you're going you can become woefully lost so that's all a part of that and and realizing um, that some of our most important work is just helping people find the next indicated Step, step on their journey or a uh, person who can assist them. So um, lots of reasons, but that's, uh, but both things, I think paying attention to sort of my own autobiography 
and um, and and knowing what I was interested in. So that when when an opportunity came up and the bishop said, "What do you want to do?" I was able to answer uh, quickly and say, "I want to be at the airport." And his response was, "You have my attention. Uh, what would you do if I assigned you to the airport? What would that look like? And how might we make that happen?" Well, then I'm going to follow that up with with sort of a logical question that, that follows on from his response. You know, if I think about a day for me at the airport, I know exactly what it looks like. I'm going to, you know, pack my bag and steal myself for what I typically don't enjoy <laughs> for an airport experience. But for you, what does a typical day, well, I shouldn't say typical because I know enough chaplains to know there is no such thing as a, as a normal day, but what right. is a... Um, what does a not surprising day for you look like in the <laughs> A not surprising day. Um, well, what I'm doing on any given day varies by the day. On Mondays and Thursdays, I accompany military remains. And so on those days, my schedule is set by the, the schedule of when the remains are due to arrive at ATL and when they're scheduled to depart because I'm the, the escort of the military escort traveling with the remains on those days. Um, on other days, you, you know, you can go earlier or you can go later. It's, um, it's helpful a lot of times to be there during the busiest time. And um, on, on a day like that, I tend to um, check in, see what other colleagues are around, see if anybody has encountered anything since the previous day that, that needs further attention. And then um, a, a good thing to do is to look at the departure boards for the longest delays because nobody will be happy uh, as a rule when flights are delayed but there there often are some people who are who are in serious distress uh, because of a delay they're, they're missing a funeral and it's the only flight to that city for example there's no way to rebook and um, so there are a lot of um, a lot of ways to then um, further our relationship as chaplains with the airport's more than 63,000 employees. And one way to do that is to go to those gates where there are delays and check in with the gate agent and, um, and say, have, have you noticed anybody who's in a particularly um, distressed way on account of this, this flight delay? And then, um, and then check in with them. And so utilize them as a resource and help reinforce that we are there to help them um, as as employees as well as to assist them in their work assisting passengers so um, a typical day though mm, yeah as you say <laughs> the uh, most chaplains don't have very typical days which is why it's a great job for people who like doing having a different routine and it's a terrible job for people who need to have the same thing day after day after day um, so Typically, I will interact with a lot of passengers, a lot of employees, um, specifically on, especially on Mondays and Thursdays with service members, and um, and then then we're there to respond to any urgent or emergent situation that that may happen. Um, thankfully, those things don't happen too often, but it's safe to say that everything that happens outside the airport also happens inside the airport. It just doesn't usually make the news. So we're, we're there to, to be of assistance insofar as possible with, with those different demographics and with those different kinds of um, situations that arise. Obviously, their sort of immediate needs are going to be different if we talk about passengers versus employees of the airport. But how do you find, how do you find your ministry being different from one to the other? Um, well, so Atlanta Airport is this largest single site of employment in Georgia. Over 63,000 people work there, and a lot of them work odd schedules, but they are there um, a good deal of their waking hours weekly. So with employees, there's an opportunity to really build up a relationship over time. And um, I think that's a parallel between airport chaplaincy and various types of healthcare chaplaincy where the staff are there. And then um, in, in this case, the, the airport, uh, the, the passengers are analogous with patients 
who generally, like patients in a hospital, generally speaking, pa passengers in an airport want to be there as short of an interval as possible. Uh, and many people hate the airport even more than some people hate the hate the hospital. So, um, so it's the the opportunity to cultivate relationships with staff members over time, and also to share with them in um, in a work location where we are all fairly happy being in an airport, and we are surrounded by literally thousands of people who don't really want to be there, um, or who who are uncomfortable being there, and so that that kind of spills over onto the people who work there. So what does it mean to offer friendly and personable service to, um, to a traveling public that is often not very happy? Uh, and uh, so to, to bond with those employees, and, and they, work all, they work all over the place, right? The Atlanta airport is 4,700 acres, and the, uh, the buildings of the, terminals and concourses themselves occupy almost 10 million indoor square feet. So it's a, it's a pretty massive place and there are people working all over the place. Um, so, so that's an analogy I think with, especially with healthcare, especially with hospital chaplaincy, um, those ongoing relationships with employees. And then passengers, again, not unlike perhaps patients in a hospital, um, they genuinely, generally don't want to, and genuinely too, don't want to be there very long. And, um, and so we have lots of, we call them cases, but they are very, they can be as, as short as 30 seconds or as long as several hours, depending on what's going on and um, how much attention an individual person or um, a family or group traveling together might need. Uh, so, we use um, a lot of the, we often use this analogy from um, Christian scripture, the, the story Jesus tells about the Good Samaritan, which, um, which involves someone being found left for dead. <laughs> uh, I haven't found too many of those in the airport, thankfully, but you know, encountering the person where they are uh, in the midst of a, of a distressing circumstance, doing what's immediately indicated for them, and then accompanying them to the next indicated person. So drawing that allusion from the story of the Good Samaritan, um, the Samaritan finds a man uh, who has been beaten and left for dead in a ditch, and then he immediately uh, dresses the, the wounds of the person as best he can, and then takes him on to the next indicated person who is the innkeeper. So that's, um, that's a lot of what we do, accompanying people from from the, the, the ditch of their circumstance to the next indicated person, whether that is an airline employee or um, an airport employee or a police officer or um, an EMT or whatever the case might be. Um, and it, it involves giving a lot of directions. So many, many, many encounters with passengers are giving directions. And sometimes um, I think we might we might say, well, anybody could give directions, and that's that's true and not true. You can't really give directions unless you are yourself oriented. I mean, you can give directions, but if you can give helpful directions, you kind of have to know uh, where the thing that person is seeking is in relation to where you are. And and I often say, that when when you're lost, when you're disoriented, that's a very spiritual state. So it's good to have um, a trustworthy person respond to your your query about how do I get from this place where I am to this place where I need to be. And often it is a big and confusing place. You give directions and, and passengers will, you know, you can tell these directions are not meaningful. Um, I hear that you're speaking words, but I don't really know how to interpret them. And so we have the luxury many, many times of being able to say, well, I'll walk with you. And often as you accompany people, literally walking, alongside them, um, in some cases just a tiny bit ahead of them, um, they often disclose the reason that they're traveling. And so you hear uh, many amazing stories of what has led this individual or this group of people uh, to be in the world's busiest airport on that day. So um, yeah, I think then the biggest 
the biggest similarity between interacting with passengers and with employees is it's it's human relationships across the board and the biggest difference is um, some of these relationships with employees have been going on in, in my case for all these years now and um, with most passengers those are very brief encounters chances are very slim that I'll see anybody again um, that I assist there are some business travelers that you see and sometimes speak to, uh, but they they become almost like employees because they're they're regulars. And generally speaking, um, if they're flying for for business, they um, they know what they're doing. They know where they're going, and um, they don't. It's not that they would never need a chaplain. They might be making a business trip after having just experienced a, um, a great personal loss and still need to make the trip. Um, but again everything pivots on on relationships and and building those and building trust and credibility and accountability which um all of which have a lot to do with visibility if you are out and about um i sometimes hear that from people um after the fact they'll meet me somewhere not in the airport and say i was in the airport on such and such a day and i saw you uh, assisting somebody and so you know you're aware that that people are watching and observing even if so for all the people i do assist directly they probably it's probably safe to say there are a few hundred others who observe that and um and take it in that it's going on so we hope that that's helpful um that people know there are chaplains in the airport that they can call on when they do have need um and seeing us in action is is not a bad thing um, for that visibility and accountability function. There are some some wonderful images. There was a New York Times article that was written about you a couple of years ago, uh, the piece in the Atlanta newspaper as well. And there are some wonderful images of you in various, um, I mean, the, the, the easy phrase for it is action shots uh, right. of actually ministering. I'm wondering what the perception is of you uh, you know, in, in some of those images, you, you look like any other traveler, except you happen to have an ID badge around your neck. In other images, you have a surplus and a stole on. That is a very different identity and presentation. So how do you find yourself to be perceived by passengers? Are you dealing with people who just sort of come up to you and start talking? Uh, is there any sort of uh, confrontation that happens? What does that look like? Um, well, sometimes i would say there's a confrontation but it's usually almost always a positive one um so i'm i, I deliberately wore um for our conversation today what i usually wear uh at the airport so this this is kind of my uniform to wear a black clerical shirt and black slacks and it's a it's a good place to to be a person who's part of a tradition that has clergy in, in uniform, if you will, uh, as a uniform service. Um, so this uniform is recognizable as a uniform by many people, even if they don't know what uniform it is. And that's a good thing because everybody who works inside the secure area at ATL wears a uniform. So that actually helps the credibility. A lot of people don't know what this uniform means and a lot of people don't know what a chaplain is um, so frequently the encounter begins with do you work here yes can you help me i'll do my best um, i'm gonna step over i'm gonna step out of the frame for just a minute and um and put on the other part of my uniform i can assure everybody in the webinar that this is my uniform. There is no change that's going to happen. <laughs> this is what I wear every day. No wardrobe change. So um, a few months ago at an airport, not in Atlanta, there was a, um, an incident involving, or there was an accident on a tarmac, which led to an injury of an airport employee. Again, another airport, not Atlanta. And so in, in response to that, all airports in the U.S. now require that all personnel of the airport who will 
have occasion to go down to what's called the apron level, so the, the aircraft level, the tarmac level, must wear, for those occasions, high visibility clothing. So when I am accompanying military remains, I've been wearing a high visibility vest most of the, on most of those days for most of those encounters for a couple years. But now uh, all airport chaplains, along with other airport employees, should be wearing these things. So this is our new vest. And um, so I have my name tag here and I also at the airport wear my security badge. So I think that we as a, a chaplaincy are becoming more visible. We also have these new caps, which um, which are increase our visibility. I'm not gonna put it on now, but um, but that's an interesting question. Like, how how do people find you, and how do people how do people know that you're a person they can ask? The reality is, what I witness when I'm a passenger or when I'm there on duty as a chaplain is that lots of people will ask just about anybody they can flag down when they have a question, you know, um, do you know where this is? Can you tell me this or that or the other? And so people are glad to get input from, um, from somebody who, who knows the information that they want. Um, and generally I said that most of these are uh, confrontations of a positive sort. Occasionally there is one of a negative sort when somebody is really at their wits end. It doesn't have anything to do with me or any other chaplain, um, but a, lo a lot of people really are exasperated as passengers, and so that level of frustration really comes out. Um, airline employees are trained to just maintain and not get riled up in response to a passenger who may be very agitated, and that's another thing that we share uh, with those employees as, as people serving in the airport. And then um, it's something that I hope as chaplains we can, can demonstrate maybe with an even greater level of uh, equanimity. Uh, what, what does it mean to, to hold that space and, and, not, and be responsive, not reactive, right? That's a big part of the chaplain's task in many, many contexts of chaplaincy. How can we respond without, without reacting and how can we, um, how can we give personalized and personable attention and service to people who, who may be taking themselves all kinds of things personally, which don't really have anything to do with them. A classic in the airport is a last minute gate change. So many people take that personally. They changed my gate, you know, and you, you internally you think yes, and they changed the gate of all the, the 300 other people who will be on board your flight too. Uh, and, and you do have time to get there. Um, but you know, just experiencing as a, as a personal affront, um, uh, a logistical change that really is not in fact intended at them personally, but that's kind of the nature of, of air travel in our, in our particular historical moment. And I think maybe especially, at a place like ATL. So, you know, there are over 300 gates, there are over 2,500 daily takeoffs and landings. So there are bound to be um, gate changes when there are weather delays and mechanical issues and other things like that. Um, but, but most people experience the airport as passengers in um, a, a, almost like a, a gauntlet to be run through, right? And so first they have to get to the airport if they're originating their flight there. Um, and a lot of people are kind of at their wits end when they arrive at the terminal. So even before they go through security and then that, that rattles a lot of people on uh, the security process. And so then if on top of all of that, their gate changes or something like that, then they tend to have an outsized reaction. So most of my training has been uh, that that we ought not to make assumptions. And, and I think that's a good rule, but I think there are sometimes assumptions we can safely make uh, as, as general, general guidelines for certain contexts. And so one of the assumptions I make is that everybody inside the terminal and concourse buildings 
of Hartsfield-Jackson Atlanta International Airport is probably not at their personal best. I just make that assumption. And then I try and lower my expectations. So it shouldn't be surprising if, if I need to give directions more than one time to the same person, even if I'm giving them very slowly, very clearly, very simply. Um, people are in a, in a state of agitation. They are not at their personal best. And, if, and I find if I lower my expectations and um, meet people where they are, then I can be of much more benefit and service to, to a greater number of people. Um, it's easy when you're familiar with a place right, to kind of have a little bit of an attitude like, oh, that's easy, it's right down there. Well, I never give directions by saying it's easy. <laughs> never do that because that just sets people up to become even more agitated if they already feel confused. Um, they, don't, they don't want you to tell them it's easy because they're already either, um, either anxious and or embarrassed that they haven't figured it out yet. So more than once somebody said to me something like this, I, I am not a stupid person, but I cannot do X or I cannot find Y. And so the first thing I do is affirm that and say, I believe you are not a stupid person. I believe that. Um, maybe I can help you figure out what it is that, that you're looking for. Um, so I think, I think people really do personalize all kinds of things and, um, and that does make them act in uh, sort of anxious and fretful kinds of ways. Uh, you know, I had another question in mind, but we're starting to get some questions from the attendees that are getting at, at some of the same issues. So I want to turn it over to them. Right. Uh, and and one, of the, one of the questions that has come in is really interesting. Uh, and that is, how do you create a private space in a ministry that is highly visible and out in the open? You know, there are, there are a thousand people coming down this concourse and yet you may need to have a private moment with one person. How right. does that happen? Um, I, I think I would think about that not so much as creating a, a private space, but, um, but, um, but a personal space, if, if that makes sense. Like I, I don't, I'm not able if we're, if I'm having a conversation with someone, in the midst of a busy concourse, I'm not, I'm not able necessarily to, to go off to, uh, to a truly private room or, or segregated space, but I can step out of the flow of traffic and help to hold a space for them. Um, ATL is a really busy public and mundane space, is like a lot of other contexts, I think, where chaplaincy happens. And it's a very useful skill for the, the chaplain to use their body to help create that space and, and to physically hold it. I don't know how well you can see me, but I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here at my desk and I've got my, my palms up. And that's a posture that I try to use a lot in the airport um, to not have anything in my hands. Um, you know, put, put the phone in the pocket, except when you need to pull it out to help people find their gate on the useful uh, phone apps. That's that's a good thing. But you know, when you're walking up and down the concourse or otherwise out and about, not having anything in your hand so you can you can um, direct people and also um, I, I literally use my hands to to hold a space as I'm talking with with somebody, not in a super overt way, but like pe people feel that um, that kind of energetic flow around that and and respond to it, and you can escort someone just to the side a little bit and have have that space um, so a lot of a lot of um, different religious traditions would think about this somewhat differently but um, thinking about some Jewish traditions and some Christian traditions just thinking through um, Jewish and Christian scriptures we have a lot of stories about people having encounters uh, that after the fact they reflected on as as being powerful or important or holy maybe maybe they didn't realize in the moment when they were happening um, but a lot of those encounters is recorded in scripture happen in mundane places or outside right uh, so not in a designated space so 
just saying that is we, we have those stories to draw on as a resource that we don't need to be in a in a in a room that's marked chapel for example uh, to do the work in fact most of the work of chaplaincy will happen outside a designated space if we're if we're responding and um, and are able to respond because we're out and paying attention um, so I think the, the use of our own bodies uh, as is a, is an important one and is a, a way that we that we create a, a safe space a sacred space although again may not be necessarily a very private space and sometimes you do need a private space and so um, you, you can work with other airport personnel to to access one of those but the vast majority of the encounters that I have happen this kind of out in in, um, in, in the, the view of many people and maybe not especially uh, totally public but yeah out out in full view well you raise the issue of of some non-christian traditions and that that flows very nicely into a, a few of the other questions that have come in um, you know even if someone doesn't know that much about christianity if you were in the airport with your collar on they know they know that you're a christian um, and so a couple people have asked are you an interfaith chaplain uh, and if so do people who are not christian know that they can use you as a resource uh, and does the airport provide resources for people who are not Christian in an overt manner? Um, yeah, so I'm, I am, um, I am a chaplain who serves at Atlanta Airport. I am uh, an Episcopal priest. Uh, I lead services in the Episcopal tradition occasionally at the airport, special, especially on um, days of observance and obligation. Um, but I'm available as a chaplain to everybody. I don't say that I am an interfaith chaplain because um, there is actually a designation of a person whose, whose religious affiliation is interfaith. My religious affiliation is Christian and specifically Episcopalian. Um, at Atlanta Airport, since 1980, we have had a, a 501c3 nonprofit called the Interfaith Airport Chaplaincy. It functions at the pleasure of the airport authority. Uh, so it was incorporated in 1981. And currently we have Christians, Jews, and Muslims serving as chaplains within the Interfaith Airport Chaplaincy. Um, in, and there's certainly room for chaplains of other traditions and potentially for, um, for a, a person or people who identify as interfaith chaplains, though we've not had anybody who has that training and that orientation, um, to my knowledge, to express interest in affiliating and, and becoming a, a chaplain of the Interfaith Airport Chaplaincy at ATL. So um, in some ways, um, the way we do airport chaplaincy is a little bit similar to um, how military chaplaincies function in, in our branches of service in the US, that is, you're there as, you're available to everybody. You, you have the designation chaplain, so you're there for anybody and everybody of any tradition or, or no, um, no affiliation or tradition in particular or even at all. Um, so sort of generally, here I am as a chaplain. And then specifically, um, those of us who are ordained in our own traditions are, have, use of the chapels to schedule services and so on and, and to offer services of our traditions at designated times in the designated chapel spaces and there are three of those at ATL um, and then I think thirdly is a lot of the the work of a chaplain regardless of his or her or their tradition is to um, to connect people who are from a different tradition who who need a chaplain of their own tradition right i'm i know how to uh i know how to easily connect with multiple rabbis with multiple imams and so on if there are people from other traditions who who need a chaplain of their own tradition to meet their particular needs so that's the third function is is helping to make those connections 
and um, but but being generally available for everybody leading services or are offering in the case of my tradition we say offering certain sacraments um, to those who who want them and um, and making sure that whatever we offer and and the manner in which we offer it that there's absolutely no coercion whatsoever uh, for any of those people whether passengers or employees right we're we're available um, and and have things to, which we which we can offer, but we will never we'll never force them on you, and um, and we'll be respectful and sensitive to what it is that you're telling us that, that you have need of, and help you access that. Uh, you mentioned it briefly, but a few people have asked uh, very specifically about your relationship uh, between your status within the Episcopal Diocese and the airport. And I would assume that this applies to those to chaplains from other traditions as well. You know, you, you work within this body of chaplaincy, but, you know, a really easy way of answering the question is who pays your salary? <laughs> uh, and, and, and where do you fit into the organization of the airport? Um, so my, my personal salary is paid by the Episcopal Diocese of Atlanta. I'm a member of uh, Bishop Robert Wright's staff. And um, so I serve at Atlanta Airport, and I work on innovations and in ministry around the Diocese of Atlanta, which is the geographic footprint of middle and north Georgia, 75 and a half counties. So I, I am a diocesan employee um, working for the bishop directly and assigned by my bishop to the airport. But even so, I can only be at the airport and serving as a chaplain because I am an affiliate member of the Interfaith Airport Chaplaincy. Right, so that that's the mechanism at Atlanta Airport, and it varies uh, airport by airport. Um, the Interfaith Airport Chaplaincy, as I mentioned, is a 501c3. Uh, it has two employees. One is the director, and the other is a part-time um, administrative assistant. So the the nonprofit itself only has those two employees, and um, the the chaplain director, executive director make sure that everybody's informed about the policies of the chaplaincy and of the airport as as they interface we have to in order to serve as a chaplain um, we, we all all of us who are part of the interfaith airport chaplaincy uh, serve at the pleasure of the airport authority which is the city of atlanta department of aviation which actually owns the airport and um and so to have that affiliation and have credentials as chaplains for Atlanta Airport, we have to um, annually renew our uh, security badges and credentials. We have to recertify annually on security measures of the airport, and we have to agree, uh, agree or reaffirm annually that we will abide within those um, security measures and that we'll abide by all. Um, all municipal regulations as well as state and federal ones that obtain to the airport so um, as we as we know is true generally but sometimes people forget there's there's no constitutional right to practice chaplaincy right so where, wherever we are uh, and interested in serving as chaplains we have to work within the networks and institutions in which those opportunities are embedded and um, so and an airport is one of those places where you definitely are aware there are all different kinds of agencies and competing jurisdictions and so on and and um, we we have to we have to work within the the strictures and confines of all of those things um, and and be respectful of the fact that other people are also embedded in those structures and trying to do their jobs uh, so I don't know if I answered all those pieces. So I am an employee of the Episcopal Diocese of Atlanta. Um, the Interfaith Airport Chaplaincy does have two employees. I'm not one of those. Um, what else? I would I would make this designation. So the the chaplaincy hat our our chaplaincy, which is a nonprofit, has two employees, and then some of us, like me, some of the chaplains are assigned by our respective religious bodies. So I'm, I'm assigned there by Bishop Wright to spend some of my working hours weekly. 
And then um, others of us are straight up volunteers. So I'm not the only Episcopalian who's there. Um, my colleague Barbara Pendergrass is there weekly and um, she is a board certified chaplain endorsed by the Episcopal Church and, um, and volunteers a day a week at ATL. So um, other, other assigned, other people who are assigned include um, two Roman Catholic priests and some Roman Catholic deacons assigned by the Archdiocese of Atlanta. And um, Salvation Army usually has an officer assigned there. And I was trying to think if there are other bodies with official assignments. I think otherwise, everybody is a, is a volunteer. Um, so we, we have different layers and levels of, um, of accountability. We have lay and um, ordained people from multiple traditions. You know, one of the uh, one of the founding purposes of the Chaplaincy Innovation Lab is to is to figure out where there are lines of commonality between chaplaincy in various sectors. Right. And anyone who knows, you know, chaplains in different sectors will tell you that uh, the credentialing, the training, uh, the continuing ed that's required for chaplains in different sectors can vary wildly. Uh, you know, in some settings, chaplaincy is very, very narrowly defined. You have to have X, Y, Z credentials. You have to do this training. You have to do this uh, continuing education. Um, what does that look like for airport chaplaincy? Is there anything specific that has to be done? Do you do any sort of continuing ed? Uh, you know, what does the professional development look like, basically, for an airport chaplain? Um, I think that varies a lot by airport. Um, there are some commonalities. I think increasingly there's an awareness that uh, across airports in, in the U.S. and internationally that we want airport chaplains to um, to be professional for sure. That doesn't mean to be paid. I mean, but to be profession professionalism and professionalization. So encouraging people to um, to extend the current levels of their training so that they might do um, an even better job and just trying to encourage everybody to think about what are the best practices of chaplaincy uh, in, in terms of airport contexts. Um, depending on the airport, you have more or less opportunities, right? Not every airport has a chaplain's, um, has a core of chaplains or a chaplaincy. Some airports are not open to that because they are afraid of um, basically church-state separation issues, and they're afraid that they wouldn't be able to adequately provide for the spiritual and religious needs of people of every religious tradition and consequently won't allow a chaplaincy at all for fear of, of um, not being able to do it adequately well. Um, there are a number of airports that will have a designated chapel or reflection room, meditation room. Uh, these spaces are called by a variety of names. They may have a space like that, but they won't allow chaplains um, to function in the airport. So it's, it really is a mixed bag uh, across the United States, and it's also true um, internationally. So as airport chaplains, um, it's not required that you be a member of this international body, but a number of us who serve as chaplains at ATL are also members of the IACAC, just in case everybody was running short on alphabet soup. Uh, that's the International Association of Civil Aviation Chaplains, which um, just celebrated its 51st birthday. And um, so that has been a really helpful organization for me. And I do part of my continuing ed every year uh, by attending the conference of that body, the IACAC. And it's really helpful to meet airport chaplain colleagues, literally from around the world, uh, who are working in similar yet distinctive contexts and dealing with many of the same issues. And so um, civil aviation worldwide has many more things in common in its various locations than different. I think there certainly are local differences and local ordinances and restrictions and opportunities for access and so on. Um, but, but it's a really great opportunity to think 
together each year and then to to build a network get to know one another for those four or five days each year and then do our work together across borders so more than once i've been um, talking in that wonderful function in facebook messenger where you can make audio calls or video calls right so i'm talking with a colleague in in paris or elsewhere in europe about here's a passenger who's coming through and this is their situation will anybody be on duty at your airport when they arrive this is what here's what they have going on so it's great to be able to liaise in those ways and um and offer to some extent a continuity of care across international boundaries and um, across religious traditions and operating in different airport stations it's um we have a growing consensus within that organization that the people who best know the credentialing that airport chaplains need are probably airport chaplains. And so that body is, is thinking about, um, could, could we make a, a comprehensive and coherent uh, set of expectations? And then could we assist people in, um, in being able to identify and acquire the kinds of training that are most useful to have as airport chaplains. So one of my um, areas of um, excitement around the Chaplaincy Innovation Lab is to see, you know, as all these different bodies of chaplains kind of, we hope, get in conversation with one another, um, are there, in fact, best practices of chaplaincy that really obtain across the board, pretty much regardless of type of chaplaincy or context of chaplaincy. And then um, and, and what are those? And how can we help one another um, learn more about them and, and better um, actualize them? And then what are the distinctives for all the different types of chaplaincy? I mentioned already parallels between healthcare, or at least hospital chaplaincy and airport chaplaincy. And um, and not and also to some extent military chaplaincy, and another one I another parallel that I find fairly often is um, without putting too fine a point on it is between airport chaplaincy and um, prison and, and jail chaplaincy, in that if you will, and I, I don't I'm not saying this jokingly, but um, you know, in order to fly. Um, you have to, as a passenger, you give up certain rights and you enter a space that's being surveilled and um, in which you, most people don't read the, the fine print on their contract for carriage, right? But it, it's in your airline ticket somewhere, somewhere available to you, probably, probably somewhere online and something that you didn't read, but you know, you've agreed, like I recognize that I'm subject to search at any time, right? So, so in a certain sense, everybody who's inside the secure area, certainly the passengers, but also the employees um, are incarcerated, right? However, briefly in those spaces and, and people act differently in those kinds of spaces. So I think, um, I think prison chaplains and airport chaplains um, and military chaplains have a lot to learn from one another about what does it mean to have situations where you have officers and inmates and officers and enlisted and officers or um, employees and um, the general public who's no longer the general public who's now the surveilled public um, so the, those kinds of things we might learn from one another about how best to um, to be available and be of service in those situations I'm, uh, I'm mindful of the clock here, so I want to ask you one final question uh, from, uh, from the attendees, but I think that it's going to hit on a lot of the issues that everyone's been getting at. Uh, and it, it's a little, bit of a, a little bit of a curveball, but not much. Uh, and that is, some of the things you have described could be accomplished by a social worker. So why does ATL have a chaplain and not a social worker? That is a good question. Um, I, I think, um, there's something historically about the role of chaplain that has, um, 
that has some credibility still with enough demographics that to identify a spiritual and emotional caregiver as a chaplain um, helps get things done. I'll illustrate with a, a brief story. About five years ago, there was um, there was a problem on Concourse C, I believe it was, and um, there are five fire stations on the at ATL, and so firefighters from the nearest station were called, and they came and they addressed the situation. But while they were making their assessment, they had to stop foot traffic in both directions on the concourse. So the chap, uh, the firefighters. Uh, appointed someone, one of their own, who turned to the passengers and said, um, thank you everyone for your cooperation and attention. We have, um, we have isolated the problem here on the concourse and as soon as we have determined that it's safe, we'll give the all clear and, and you'll be able to um, negotiate the concourse. But until then, please just hold your positions. We'll, we'll let you know something something more as soon as we know it. So this had just been delivered and um, about that time two of my chaplain colleagues arrived and um, they conferred with their counterparts in the fire department who were there responding and the passengers noticed that they were chaplains based on um, <laughs> various identifiers and said thank God chaplains, you all are here. Nobody will tell us what's going on. And so one of my colleagues turned to them and said, well, the fire department has responded and they are trying to isolate the problem. And as soon as they are sure that everything is all right, they'll give the all clear and you'll be able to move freely about the concourse again. But until then, just, just please stay where you are. Thank goodness you're here. No one would tell us anything. Right, so whatever the value is of having somebody who's identified as a spiritual and religious caregiver, um, apparently this is a position of public trust. And so you can believe the same words from the chaplain and, and may, maybe actually be able to hear them when the same message verbatim had just been given by another professional um, that for whatever reason people were, were skeptical of. So, um, I think there's value in that and there's certainly value in having social workers but we don't really have a mechanism for having social workers in the airport except that we do have other nonprofits operating in our airport who in fact do have training as social workers um, so that's hope Atlanta that's a separate nonprofit that also operates at the pleasure of the airport and specifically are there um, overnight and through the wee hours and uh, addressing problems that arise when people are stranded and um, so on. Uh, I don't know if that answers the question very well. I think that it behooves chaplains to have some clues about how to work with people. We, we, need, a, we need a pretty big and diverse toolkit because a lot of what we're asked to do at any given time is the work of a social worker or, or is the work of a customer service representative? Anybody can give directions. So um, why are my directions sometimes perceived as more valuable, right? Um, there's some, some identified, uh, for, for, all the, for all the evidence to the contrary, there's, there's still a fair amount of, um, of trust placed in identified religious professionals. So I think, I think that continues to have some value um, at, at least in the United States. And what I hear from colleagues from around the world is that's the case in other countries still today too, at least in airports. I don't know about everywhere. Uh, well, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. This has been a fantastic conversation. Uh, and you know, there, there were more questions that we didn't get to uh, unfortunately, in, the, in this brief time that we have. So uh, clearly, this is a very interesting topic. And we're very, very glad to have started off our webinar series uh, with you. And I'll just remind everyone that this will go on the Chaplaincy Innovation Lab website at chaplaincyinnovation.org. We'll upload it to YouTube. Uh, you can follow us also on Twitter at, at Chaplain Lab. Uh, and of course, you should be in touch uh, if you would like any more information uh, or to suggest future webinars. We're happy to take 
uh, suggestions there as well. So thank you very much to our guest, the Reverend Donna Mote, who is the Missioner for Engagement and Innovation for the Episcopal Diocese of Atlanta and chaplain to the Hartsville-Jackson International Airport. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye.